insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights and Entertainment. This is episode 125, the squeaky microphone. Oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> episode 125, the little ladies' man. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my brilliant and inspiring co host with the squeaky mic, Michelle Whalen. Hi, everyone. Yes, let's not move that mic stand until we grease it up a little bit. <laughs> Whatever. How are you doing today, sweetheart? I am fantastic. I'm so glad to hear that. How's your week been? Busy. Yeah. Very. That's what happens when you have to busy. go into the office, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I do that five days a week, by the way. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Mm-hmm. I guess I'll stop making funny so you don't throw anything at me. Right. Mm-hmm. Probably so, best that way. <laughs> uh, kind of a slow news week this week. Not a lot going on. A couple of quick stories here. So it's probably not going to be that long of a show. So today in our Disney Detective We'll take a look at a four-year-old true gentleman in the Magic Kingdom and an extra magical way to skip lines at the parks. Then in our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy, Hasbro's newest wares are on display, plus the art of Star Wars The Mandalorian Season 2. And get ready with your prop. And for our new entertainment news, who's going around the world in 80 days? Plus Netflix buys the <laughs> Chocolate Factory and more. Got to get a fishing wire on that next time. There you go. We'll plan and better next time. As always, we'll finish up with our insightful picks of the week and some afterthoughts. But before we do that, I would like to invite our listening and viewing audience to subscribe to the podcast. You can get audio versions of this podcast listed as Insights and Entertainment Video versions of all of our podcasts can be found listed as Insights into Things. We're available on Apple, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, any place you can get a podcast these days. I would also invite you to write to us, give us your feedback. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash insights underscore things. We are on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast or Instagram at instagram.com slash insights into things. Or you can get us on our official website at www.insightsintothings.com, which does work this week. Oh, well, that's good. Didn't work last week. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, are we ready to get started? Sure. All right. <laughs> I don't think that's, that's uh, the sound you wanted. That's, that's the wrong soundboard. Hang hang on a second here. That's the one thing that you I didn't, didn't test, check in, of course. in pre production. There oh, we go. Oh, that's funny. It's always something, right? Well, you know what? Just goes to show you that we're a homegrown uh, studio here. Absolutely. Go with uh, Disney Detective. So maybe chivalry is not dead in today's day and age. Well, at least not in one four-year-old. In a recent visit to Disney's Magic Kingdom in Walt Disney World, young Bernardo was captured making a gentlemanly gesture to a few of the beloved princesses. His mother, Vanessa, a resident of Florida, recently posted the footage on TikTok. In a brief clip, the young man is seen from behind watching a parade of characters pass by, including Snow White and other princesses. Some of them were walking and some of them were riding on floats. And before, um, it, uh, before first politely waving to by the cavalcade, Bernardo takes his hat 
and tips it off to the ladies. Appropriately enough, it's a baseball-style hat with Mickey ears. The princesses, in turn, respond to his gesture in their own magical way. Some of them are waving, and others take the gesture one step further and even curtsying in response. So the clip had over 30 million views, with many of the viewers commenting on how it brought them to tears seeing this four-year-old true gentleman. Speaking to Fox News, his mother commented that he's a great kid, very polite, and happy. He loves Disney movies such as Beauty and the Beast, The Incredibles, Monsters, Inc., but his favorite is Toy Story. His mom captioned the video, Disney's True Prince. That's got to be the cutest thing I think I've ever seen. Yeah, and it's it's a quick, what, 23-second yeah, video. Yeah, not long at all. And you just, you know, see him from behind, and every time the princess comes by, he just takes his hat and and tips it off, and just seeing the response of the princesses. Oh, the, just the reaction that they react, had, they how were just surprised like, they were. Like, you know, or they'd curtsy yeah. or bow to yeah. him, and it was it was just adorable. It was really cute. Now, you know, I don't mean to rain on anyone's parade here because you know I don't do that sort of thing. You never. <laughs> but you know, the mom coached him to do these things and set the shot off and all that stuff. But make sure to wave. Make sure to you know. But still, it was really cute yeah. to see. It yeah. would have been nice to see the other side to see his reaction to right. their reaction. To, yeah, like if she did an after video right. of you know they you know they did whatever yeah, yeah. Or, you know yeah. So. so I guess parades are back at Disney. Well, it's still the cavalcades oh, where okay. Okay. It, they're not announced. They just kind of happen nice. by chance, and there's usually only like one or two. Floats from what I understand, so nothing. So our strategy full blown yet. So our strategy of using the parades to get on short lines doesn't work, but we do have another suggestion <laughs> that might work. Let's talk well, about that. I don't that know one. if we really want to say that this is a suggestion <laughs> to use. So you know, this is one of those. There's always some Florida man story of you know something stupid that somebody in Florida did. So, of course, this week, you know, no exception. So, obviously, for those that plan Disney trips and everything, there are books and blogs telling you how to have a magical Disney World experience. But one Florida man discovered the ultimate travel hack, using an app that lets you skip the lines. An app that everybody would want for sure. But the catch is the app was running on a possibly stolen cast member iPad. So a local Florida news station reported that uh, this 30-year-old um, person had allegedly uh, did this last June. Using the unauthorized device, he was able to give himself and a group traveling through the park with him a jump to the front of the line. So according to the um, according to the report, he was leading an unauthorized tour in Hollywood Studios using the iPad to skip lines for the park's rides by making reservation overrides. So one Disney World fan site theorized that he may have been taking advantage of Disney's system that lets people with disabilities reserve certain times for a ride so that they don't have to wait in line. This would seemingly agree with a quote reported by WDW News Today, which classified the app as a private app for qualifying guests that on, that's only installed on devices owned by Disney World. However, this person was pulling it off. It seemed like it was both easier and better and less confusing than the FastPass, MaxFast reservation system, which obviously we've talked about before. It's the antiquated system, which is due to be replaced by the new service Genie Plus, which we've also talked about as well. So as with every travel hack, there are some minor trade-offs and inconveniences. This person ended up having to give back the iPad to a Disney investigator and was issued a warning by Disney for trespassing. He reportedly told authorities that he didn't know it was stolen. No, oh, I didn't know that was stolen. I thought you gave these to everybody. <laughs> right. And there was one uh, one conversation going on where 
somebody uh, like, you know, so he was doing these unauthorized tours and they thought like he was posting on Craigslist or something like, yeah, that's where I'm going to book a, a tour <laughs> right, right, through right. Craigslist. That seems totally <laughs> reputable, you know. Well, oh, and they okay. even speculated in the article itself that the the iPad itself hadn't been reported as stolen. Right. Which makes me wonder, was there a cast member who was who, involved with this? Right, exactly, because that was because they were actually talking about this on the local radio station right. the other day, and they were saying, "You mean to tell me that you know they couldn't do an IP search or something and right. find out? Like, obviously, you had to use a, a username and a login, right. a password." Right. To probably get well, into the and thing. And it's an iPad. There's a built-in tracker built right. into the iPad to see where these things are at yeah, all times. Some, somebody had to have known something, Yeah, you know. There, there's uh, something oh, fishy going on there. It that, was stolen from my car. Right. Well, I'm guessing it probably shouldn't have even left the park. I'm, exactly. You know, I'm guessing yeah. it's one of those things that... Yeah. Oh, I thought this was my own personal one. Big giant mouse sticker on the yeah. back. Of it. Some somebody's getting fired over this one. Yeah. Yeah. So. so that was kind of funny. But that was all we had for our Disney detective this week. Mm -hmm. We'll take a quick break, and I'll be back with our tales from the edge of the galaxy. For over seven years. The Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy this week, since I pushed the right button this time. Awesome! Hasbro unveils new Star Wars merchandise. If you're a Star Wars geek like me, you probably eagerly await the annual reveal from Hasbro. Well, this year's line of merchandise is out, so you don't have to wait any longer. Hasbro's latest additions to the Black Series and the Vintage Collection lines of models are out including a replica of Rey Skywalker's iconic lightsaber from Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker. The new products were unveiled during Hasbro's Star Wars Fan First livestream and will include many fan favorites such as the Mandalorian and Grogu, Emperor Palpatine, Stormtroopers, and Lando Calrissian. All the toys and models revealed by the toy maker will be available to purchase from the spring of 2022 but no official date has been revealed. Hasbro indicates this new Force Effects lightsaber is their most realistic one to date and will feature a real metal handle, which all the other ones do, but it will feature the first Twist to Ignite feature, which was demonstrated in the actual movie itself. It'll have Battle Clash and Blaster effects, as well as Molted Blade Tip effects, which all the other ones, the new ones, have at this point, too. The Yellow Blade, made famous by Rey in the film, is removable, and the lightsaber comes with a stand for display. This offers anyone with a lightsaber the option to use the model as a toy or to light up any room as a centerpiece. Available at most major retailers, the approximate retail price will be $264.99. It is available for pre-order now, by the way, I noticed. Hasbro also unveiled an epic batch of galactic figures coming to the toy company's Black Series line. Eight brand new models will be added to the line and will include six-inch models of the Mandalorian and Grogu, Leia Organa, and numerous characters from the Mandalorian television series. 
Well, the Mandalorian and Grogu figure will retail for $36.99. All other figures in this announcement will retail for the uh, same lower price of approximately $26.49. Uh, the final group of figures Hasbro is releasing features new additions to their vintage collection line of models. Some of the models include characters from the original trilogy, including Emperor Palpatine, Lando Calrissian, Stormtroopers, Bib Fortuna. Uh, also included in Hasbro an, as an, uh, Hasbro's announcement is a retro-inspired prototype Stormtrooper, which has a multicolored body armor, uh, as opposed to the traditional white and black. Figures in the Vintage Line collection also vary in price, ranging from $13.99 to $41.99, although most of the items are at the lower end of the scale. So this is kind of like the pre-Christmas announcement type thing that, that I always like to see where mm -hmm, absolutely. what's the new stuff coming out. Right. You know, the biggest thing that, that I think I'm interested in is probably going to be the lightsaber. Of course, because you have all the... <laughs> Um, well, and the last two that came out, because you got me the Palpatine mm -hmm. one, you got yep. me the Revan one. Both of them are awesome. They're, mm -hmm. they're, the effects on the new <coughs> ones are You can really definitely neat. see how it's evolved from Absolutely. the first ones to, you know, to well, now. So. And the first one that you ever got me is my Gen 1 Force Effects back when, uh, <clears throat> before Hasbro was doing them. Force right. Effects was doing them. Mm -hmm. And... and uh, it's the Gem 1 Darth Vader. Right. And I still have that one. Yep. And you can really see the the improvement in, in material and quality and crafting and everything through the time. Now you got all kinds of effects with these and everything. Right, right. Uh, so I'm kind of excited to see them. They're a little more expensive, though. Mm-hmm. Uh, the original force effects were going somewhere in the range of the 150 to 200 Yeah, weren't they range. like 199 I think? Yeah, you can get them between so. 150 and, and 200 But yeah. um. And they're, they're pretty cool. I like the new mm -hmm. stands, too. You can yeah. hang them on the wall, which which I'm not a big fan of. Right. That's something where we need to look at, like, Etsy again yeah, to kind yeah. of find you something to put them all together yep. on, on one thing. So I don't want to wait till the spring for this stuff, though. But <laughs> anyway. Supply and demand, honey. <laughs> if I don't want to wait till the spring, December's right around the corner, right? True. So in December, The Art of Star Wars, The Mandalorian Season 2 is coming. If you're jonesing for your fill of The Mandalorian while we wait for the much-anticipated third season, you might not have to wait much longer. Lucasfilm announced The Art of Star Wars, The Mandalorian Season 2, a hardcover collection of concept art chronicling the making of the, of the hit Disney Plus original series, Written by Lucasfilm's Phil Zo Zostak, sorry, Phil Zostak, the book arrives December 14th and comes filled with concept art, character, vehicle, weapon, and creature designs. Also included are interviews with key crew and creatives, including show creator, executive producer and writer John Favreau, and executive producer, director, and writer Dave Filoni. In addition, the cover features new artwork by Lucasfilm legend Doug Chang, created exclusively for this release. The Art of Star Wars, The Mandalorian Season 2, arrives December 14th and is available for pre-order now. Now, I don't generally collect the art books. You have. I have a You couple. actually do have quite a, quite a few of them. But we don't have a coffee table, right, you know, right. to lay them out. So unfortunately, they're all on. They're you on know. bookshelves, right? Yeah, right. I don't. I don't really get to uh, enjoy them as much on the bookshelves. Yeah, it's usually once you get it, you kind of look through it, and then. Well, that was like you got me the the Star Wars vault years ago. Yeah, yeah. I still haven't even opened it. That thing is still primed and wrapped in the plastic at this so point. So how much can we get for it? On eBay? I don't know. I haven't, I haven't looked it up. Yeah. But uh, the problem with the books is just they're so damn heavy. Right. You know? That is true. But the, the nice thing, too, is, you know, if you watch The Mandalorian, um, or they even do it with Marvel with What If as well, when they roll the credits, they show all these concept art right, pictures. Right, right. So that's what's always kind of a cool thing when we've watched The Mandalorian show is to – wait till the credits and actually watch 
the different art yeah. that they came up with to see what their vision of a certain scene was and how true they matched it well, to the actual show. What's kind of neat is everyone knows and loves the Ralph McQuarrie art that was all the concept right. art for the original trilogy, mm -hmm. none of which ever made it in its original form into the movies. <clears throat> but you can see the inspiration as it goes along. Mm -hmm. And seeing the sketches and the concept art does the same thing at the end of the episode where right. you can see what that inspiration mm -hmm. was and what those original ideas yeah. were and <clears throat> how it kind of evolved from that into the final product. Right, right. So it's a great glimpse. And I'm hoping the book itself has a lot of that concept art mm -hmm. in there. So you can get that behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Like you can watch interviews and you can see the behind the scenes, you know, footage and stuff that the documentaries did. But the artwork itself is really the root of all of it. That's where that imagination starts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And to see the evolution of that is actually really neat to see how right. the how the developers' brains are actually working with this stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was all we had for our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. We'll be back in a minute with our entertainment news of the week. <laughs> Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. for entertainment news. So if you're a fan of David Tennant, and let's be honest, who isn't, uh, then there is a treat coming to you from BBC. So David Tennant takes on the iconic role of Phineas Fogg in the upcoming BBC One ad adaptation of Jules Verne's classic novel Around the World in 80 Days. Complete with a rather dashing mustache, Tennant travels on his globe-trotting adventure, flanked by his traveling companions, uh, Passpark Tote and Abigail Fix. Filmed in Cape Town, Africa, which moonlights as locations in Yemen, Tennant and his company will travel to the port town of Al... Hmm... Yeah, I'm not even going to help you with that one. I yeah. I'm not sure. Various areas that <laughs> – basically they filmed everything in Cape Town and it's going to look like other various desert areas throughout the, the story. Al, Al Hudeya. Sure. And the empty quarter and the desert that is on the way to the city of Aden. 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 Uh, so Tennant as Phineas Fogg, the intrepid adventurer, and his uh, – uh, ingenuine? In ingenuity. Oh, geez. Ingenuity and clever uh, contraptions are put to the test through the voyage. Um, his companion, um, I guess it's... Abraham Coma. Abraham Coma uh, stars as Passepart Tote, who is Fogg's trusty French sidekick who goes with him every step of the journey. And then the crown star, Lonnie... Uh, Bench, Benesh. Benesh plays Abigail Fix, a journalist who accompanies the men in order to chronicle the adventure. So production on the eight episode series wrapped in March this year, and the show will be the latest in a long line of adaptations of Jules Verne's classic story, which Tennant follows in the footsteps of the likes of David Niven, uh, Pierce Brosnan and Steve Coogan, who all had played Fogg. That was very good, sweetheart. You did very good pronouncing all those. <laughs> and you put the 
<laughs> you put the article in this week. What was I going to do? Yeah. So that guy, that guy, <laughs> oh, and that one. Yeah, you need, that's, to, you need to screen the articles and only get articles that don't have tough names in them. Right, exactly. <laughs> Thanks. So this actually looks kind of cool. Yeah, it does. The trailer actually looked rather interesting. Yeah, I'm not going to play it. It's right here on the screen. Right, because we don't want to get, get taken, down. taken down for anything. But yeah, go in and look for the Around the World in 80 Days teaser uh, for BBC One. So hopefully it'll come out on BBC America probably after, I'm guessing, Probably. Um, yeah. I got to tell know. you, David Tennant looks pretty good with the mustache. He does. He looks very dapper. There was actually a, a friend of mine who does a lot of different cosplay, and he was like, I need a three-piece suit now <laughs> so that I can pull this pull this look off. So, yeah, he looks, he looks really good like that. Yeah, yeah. Looks very serious, though. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, everyone, we always love every, everything he's in, he's awesome in. So. Yeah. Even he's, when we watched that, that one, like, detective drama where he was yes, the bad guy. Yes. And it was like, it was kind of creepy because you're like, no, it's the doctor. He's not yeah. supposed to be bad. I do get a kick out of the fact anytime he's in anything that revolves around traveling or time travel. Right. It's like, well, he's got that one mastered already. Yeah, right? he knows you how know? to do that. He's, he's got that down pat. <laughs> he's good like that. So what else do we have today? So it seems that Netflix has acquired the works of Roald Dahl, the late British author of celebrated children's books such as Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. The video streaming giant said on Wednesday that it acquired um, Roald Dahl's story company, which manages the rights of the author's characters and stories. So no financial terms were discussed, but the deal builds on a partnership that was actually struck in 2018 to create a slate of animated TV series under which Charlie and the Chocolate Factory is getting a reboot by Academy Award winning filmmaker Taika Waititi. And Netflix is working with Sony on an ab. Uh, an adaptation of Matilda the musical. The New Deal paves the way for Netflix to bring all of the authors' back catalog to the screen. So these projects opened our eyes to a much more ambitious venture, the creation of a unique universe across animated and live-action films and TV, publishing games, immersive experiences, live theater, consumer products, and more, said Netflix uh, co-CEO Ted Sarandis and Luke Kelly, managing director of the Raul Dahl Story Company, and Dahl's grandson said in a joint statement. So Dahl had actually passed away in 1990 at the age of 74, but his books, which include the BFG, the Twits, and Fantastic Mr. Fox remain popular with young readers with more than 300 million copies sold worldwide and translations in 63 languages. Now, I'm, yeah, I'm going to claim ignorance here. I was not aware that he was he was responsible for that many you know, popular books. Mm-hmm. Um, I knew about Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and that was James it. and the Giant Peach is another one uh, of, <clears throat> and it, yeah, of his, And it too. makes sense because it's in that same style of his. Yeah, right. He's got a very distinctive style. Right. He has a very distinct style. And and it's funny because not a, like, because a lot of his things, if they're not live action, they've been doing like the claymation right, right. type thing. So like the Fantastic Mr. Fox is a perfect example. And... Um, James and the Giant Peach is a little bit live action, but also the claymation. I think um, the BFG was also claymation. Stop motion, the stop motion, motion yeah. animation. Yeah. So I don't know if it's just that's the area that they decided to go with and kind of kept going with you know, it. It's, or It's funny being a, a computer gamer. BFG has a whole different meaning to me. <laughs> <laughs> it, I is, bet it, does. it is not big friendly giant, I can tell no, you. No, no, but it's funny because all of his stories it, it's funny because they're children's stories, but they're they have a dark 
Yeah, that's cloud for, yes. over them. Like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory is not a really happy story no. unless you're Charlie. But even then, Charlie kind of has Charlie, a yeah. very dismal I mean, they basically upbringing. torture the kids. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, you know, hey, here's my Chocolate Factory. Spoilers, right. you know, where all the other kids... They're all brats right. in one way, shape, or form, you know, or the fantastic but Mr. But that doesn't necessarily mean you can do what you did to him in the in the book. Right, exactly. And then, you know, the fantastic Mr. Fox, it's, you know, it's like you're stealing the chickens and, you know, it's like. Well, it's, that's what foxes do. Well, so. yeah, but it, it's, yeah, it's it's one of those. I know there are people that are, are fans of, of all of his stuff, that, yeah. you know, and it's one of those, eh, you know, he. We'll watch them, but I don't, you know, like, honestly, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory scared the bejesus out of me when I was a kid. He he is not Disney. He is definitely not Disney, hence why he's on Netflix. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. So that was all we had for our entertainment news Mm -hmm. this week. We'll be right back with our insightful picks. Go for your insightful pick. So my insightful pick from comes from a Disney Plus series. Um, it's it's a teen family adventure uh, story. So it is the Mysterious Benedict Society. So after winning a scholarship competition, four gifted orphans are recruited by the strange and unusual Mr. Benedict for a dangerous mission to save the world from a global crisis known as... The emergency. Rainy, Sticky, Kate, and Constance must infiltrate the evil LIVE Institute to discover the truth behind the crisis. When the headmaster, the sophisticated Dr. Curtin, appears to be behind this worldwide panic, the kids of the mysterious Benedict Society must devise a plan to defeat him. The Mysterious Benedict Society is an American mystery adventure uh, television series, which is actually based on the children's books by Trenton Lee Stewart. The series stars Tony Hale as Mr. Benedict, who gathers the four children to stop the global emergency. Hale also betrays Benedict's twin brother, Mr. Curtin, who is the founder of the school the children are infiltrating. The series premiered on Disney Plus uh, in June and consists of eight episodes. So it's a, a definitely a... A mystery show, very much like Sulphur Springs, uh, which was a show that uh, Maddie and I had watched over the summer. Um, Lots of little plot twists and turns and why are they doing this? It has a very, like, 1960s kind of feel to it where you're not really sure when it's uh, taking place. There's, um, you know, television uh, there's TV. So the idea is that there are uh, radio waves, uh, subliminal messages that are going out into the the airway um, that not everybody can hear and that they're using children to be these messengers to to send these message. And basically they talk about the emergency, but nobody knows what it is. Like, is it the end of the world? Is it, oh, we better go get this because the emergency is happening, but nobody talks about what it is. And what ends up happening is they they do this competition to kind of find the best kids for this mission. And you have these, uh, you know, four orphans who basically come together and kind of perf- uh, um, come together as this like super group of kids to try and help. So we're only, I think we're only two episodes or three episodes in. So like the traveling wheelberries. Sure. We'll go with that, <laughs> but it's, it's really cute. It's definitely, you know, something, you know, for the family to watch together. So. All right. Cool pick. Thank you. So my pick this week is a documentary on Netflix called Mercury 13. Mercury 13 is the untold story of women testing for spaceflight in the 1960s. In this Netflix documentary, the tales of 13 female pilots who dreamed of becoming astronauts 
yet were denied the opportunity by NASA, are finally brought to light. When Neil Armstrong stepped on the surface of the moon, he declared that he had taken one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. But what if that one small step had been taken by a woman? What would that have represented at a time when the American public was just starting to wake up to women's rights? This new documentary, uh, this new documentary film on Netflix hopes to answer that question. Mercury 13 explores the paths of 13 female pilots who were subjected to many of the same rigorous tests that all the male Mercury 7 were and either passed or exceeded their male counterparts in every one of them. Despite the triumphant completion of many invasive tests, they were still prevented from entering NASA's space training program. This despite the fact that NASA's direct competition in Russia was moving forward with the first woman in space. The film details many of the physiological and psychological testing that these heroic women had to endure. The same testing the men went through, and in many cases didn't fare nearly as well. It chronicles their journey in the early 1960s when the space race heated up with the Russians. The documentary details the storied and impressive flying history of all the women in the program, talking about how they got into flying and what some of their inspirations were. The same doctor who conducted the government-funded test on the male astronauts had to find private funding to fulfill his ambition of proving that women were just as capable because the government refused to fund the research. The film also details the legal challenges the women raised before Congress and culminates with their finally being honored by NASA at the launching of the first space shuttle piloted by a woman. It's a touching and inspirational story that is indicative of the sad state of affairs our society was in with regard to the equal rights for women in the 1960s. While the program shows us how far we've come to combat some of these discriminatory behaviors, it also serves to shine a light on the progress yet to be made in the search for equality for everyone, regardless of gender, race, ethnicity, religion, or identity. It's programs like this that help me see a brighter tomorrow for our own future female engineer, and it's an inspiration to all young women that you should never let anyone tell you that you can't achieve your dreams. The, the show itself, it was a very low-key documentary. And what I liked about it was they went and they talked to all of these women. And these women conveyed the stories themselves. It wasn't stuff that was stock footage and, you know, historians that were reading it. They actually talked to the women. And you could hear in their voices the emotion and the disappointment and the betrayal that they felt by their own country after going through everything that they went through. And a lot of these women started out with flying for um, the, during the war or after the war, they, um, their, their parents had flown uh, the women auxiliary corps that did their part for the war at the time and they felt a patriotic surge that they wanted to be a part of this. And it was, it was literally just male chauvinism that shut the whole thing down mm. all the, while the whole time the Russians were in the process of doing the same very thing itself. Mm. And it was one of those things where we lit, we had a head start. This was one of those things that we had a head start. We had 13 women before Russia even thought about it. We had 13 women who had gone through these tests and were qualified and they just shut the program down. We actually had a chance to be one of the first before, because the only first we've ever won with the Russians in, in the space race was stepping on the moon. Right. And that was at the end of the decade. And we, we could have won this one here and had multiple women in space. And one of the things that I thought was very interesting was one of the tests that they did was a, was a sensory deprivation chamber. And they, they took the women and they put them in this pool of water, this giant pool of water in a big room, completely dark, and they made them neutrally buoyant so they just floated there. They had earplugs in 
and they set the temperature of the water and the air to their body temperature so they couldn't even feel the water. They literally, it was, they were trying to simulate weightlessness in space. Okay. And the women excelled at this. They were, they could spend hours in this chamber and they said the guys, the men that when they went through this, they went bonkers within like 15 minutes. They Hmm. couldn't, they couldn't stand it. And it was funny to see the dynamic between the genders and how they could handle these things. And it was almost indicative of, okay, well, if you're going to send somebody on a six-month mission to Mars, you're probably better off sending women on that than mm-hmm. men because the men are probably going to go insane and kill each other. Right, before they even get there. Right, right. So it was really neat to see some of these comparisons that they did and and some of the comments that the – the astronauts, because they showed stock footage of some of the astronauts mm. and some of the comments that they made. And we saw it when we were watching the uh, right. the space program on Netflix, that one series that we watched. Right. And they really took it from that stock footage because it was just insult. Even now, I, I, I see that stuff and it, it irks me now to see mm-hmm. what these, these you know barbarians were saying. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the show itself was actually very good. It was... It was um, about two hours long. It wasn't okay. incredibly long, but very well done. They showed footage. They showed time with the women, and it was it was it, it's something that would serve as an inspiration to anybody, not mm-hmm. just other women. But Mercury Thirteen on Netflix. We'll be right back. So what else do we have? We have some afterthoughts. afterthoughts. Mm -hmm. What are we talking about today? So this coming weekend in Oaks, Pennsylvania is... RetroCon! (laughs) So the show is on Saturday and Sunday. The Saturday times are from 10 to 5.30 and tickets are $20 at the door. Sunday is from 9 to 4 and tickets are $15 at the door. And kids 12 and under are free. And again, it's at the Greater Philadelphia Expo Center in Oaks, Pennsylvania. Also this weekend uh, is Monster Mania 47 in Hunt Valley, Maryland. Um, whole lot of celebrities are going to be there. Actually, a, a, a boatload of some really good people. So if you're in the area, definitely uh, a show to, to go and see. Um, then uh, October 2nd through 3rd, back at the Greater Greater Philadelphia Expo Center is Brickfest. So if you are a Lego aficionado, this is definitely the uh, show for you. And then, of course, we have the two toy shows uh, in October as well, October 9th and 10th. Uh, We have uh, the Delaware Train Show on Saturday, and on Sunday is the October Toy Show, Oktoberfest Toy Show, both uh, housed at the Nurse Shrine Center in Newcastle, Delaware. Um, Unfortunately, we had months ago had talked about Wizard World Philadelphia um, coming to the Greater Philadelphia Expo Center sometime in November. Now, if you try and look it up, there's no information about it. Uh, If you go to the Greater Philadelphia Expo Center website, they don't even list it. And now it almost has it, it. If you do a Google search, it it gives you dates for the Philadelphia Convention Center, which is where it has always been before. But when you go to the convention website, they don't have anything listed. So I'm guessing Wizard World Philadelphia, which now became that other company, uh probably isn't going to happen this year, unfortunately. So That's what it looks like. We'll keep checking, though, and if we find anything Yeah, if we find anything out, uh, we'll, it does we'll look like Wizard World Chicago is, is going on, and I right. think that's going to be the last event that Wizard World sanctions. And that's what they said, you know, when we had the article on the right. show. Right, so, so. No, no information about anything else, so. Yep. So before we do go, I would uh, invite our listening and viewing audiences to subscribe to the podcast. You can get audio versions of this podcast listed as Insights into Entertainment. Video versions of the podcast can be found listed as Insights into Things. We are on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, 
Uh, Podbean, I want to throw Podbean out there. They're our new video hosting provider. We're on Castro. Buzzsprout is our audio uh, provider. Uh, Pandora, we're on pretty much any place you can get a podcast these days. I would also ask you to write to us. Give us your show notes, your your suggestions. Uh, we would love to get more uh, shows that are coming up in your area that we can plug. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can find us on Twitter at insights underscore things. We're on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. You can find us on Instagram at instagram.com backslash insights into things. You can get audio versions of this podcast on the web at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com. You can find video versions of all of our different podcasts at youtube.com backslash insights into things. You can find video versions of this podcast now on our host at podcast.insightsintothings.com. I threw you off there, didn't I? Yeah, you did. Yeah. I'm like, uh, and we stream five days a week on Twitch. You can find us at Twitch TV backslash insights into things. Or you can go to our official website and get all that and more at www.insightsintothings.com. That's it. I think that's it. Another one in the books. Have a good week, everyone. Bye. Bye.